Hi, and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim. This is Dr. K. As we continue our discussion of Confederation here on the History Hut Canada. Yep. The Canadian edition. <laughs> Canadian eight. edition 8, yep. So uh, we'll yep. just get right into it. Pretty smooth Again. sailing uh, after July 1st, well, you, 1867. You, you would hope so. The first Canada Day? <laughs> yeah, that's right. What a party first that was. First Canada Day, well, it was, I told you before, first of it many. was cold and damp, and some some people were missing from it, like the whole Nova Scotia delegation. Yeah, you'd think it would be quite good, you know, we've kind of got this idea going, got confederation, it's all passed, but and actually, uh, when they have the first election um, that first year, it doesn't go well at all. Uh, the vote is actually split again in New Brunswick and uh, pro-confederation forces lost in Nova Scotia so uh -oh. you know, after all of that trouble uh, it looked like there was going to be uh, even bigger trouble for uh, for John A. Macdonald so the, the Nova Scotia legislature actually sits for the first time January 1868 and the first thing it does is try and get out of confederation they refuse to <laughs> <laughs> the attorney general put forward a repeal resolutions so they try and get out of confederation Their the repeal as resolutions are, are are quickly approved and you have to remember of course that it, confederation in Nova Scotia had been quite politically sensitive remember I said you know kind of black borders around the newspapers and mm. so people weren't all that excited about it and in fact um in an open letter to the people, this other politician who is a kind of really well-known, uh, famous Nova Scotia politician, Joseph Howe, uh, he wrote, and I'll just quote this, and, and if you don't know who the Sabine women are, just go home and look it up. Uh, Rejoice at Confederation. The Romans did not ask the Sabine women to dance and sing on the very day of their captivity. So not not a happy camper at all. And, and of course, if you compare that to George Brown's 9,000 word essay going, oh, this is like the best thing that ever happened the best thing since sliced bread as we say in Scotland <laughs> um, you can see the difference so um, even MacDonald commented on this and this is another quote from MacDonald and he said uh, Nova Scotia is about to take the shilling and enlist though I am afraid it will consider itself for some time a conscript rather than a volunteer and of course that's a reference to press ganging you know they've, they've taken the, the, the queen's money or the you know the, the king's money or whatever uh, and um, well, in this case, it's the Queen, Queen Victoria, but right. I'm taking the Semantics. Queen's money, but they're just not happy about it at all. Now, there are a couple of reasons why Nova Scotians were unhappy about Confederation, and one has to do with economics, and the other has to do with uh, just, you know, and it's an emotional issue. So, of course, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to actually kind of show to Nova Scotians that this is going to be beneficial to them because it seems unlikely to be true. I think I said to you before that Nova Scotia didn't do a lot of its business with with Canada, I mean, the people kind of looked at the interior of Canada as this kind of backwaters. They didn't do a lot of uh, work with that. And so now Nova Scotia, of course, it gives up its own debt, but it has to take its slice of the overall Canadian debt and it has to work within the, the, uh, the Canadian uh, tariff and uh, they're going to be paying for double government. And so it just, you know, looks like more of a burden than, it, than an advantage. And in fact, the merchant interests or the mercantile interests in Nova Scotia uh, were, were so concerned that, that they actually established a, an anti-confederation league. So they're like, yeah, we don't think this is working for us at all. And they're worried, of course, about losing their access to American markets. So, you know, uh, really kind of practical reasons. And, and to be truthful over the long haul it hadn't really it wouldn't it wouldn't really go well for them not that they would know that <laughs> and then um, emotionally on an emotional level Nova Scotians thought of themselves more as British colonists and they actually uh, even people like Joseph Howe thought that perhaps sometime in the future they would become independent within the British Empire so be like you know the little kingdom of Nova Scotia <laughs> rather than Nova Scotia as one of the many provinces of confederation so uh, there's actually uh, you know they thought that that they had the a special relationship with the Americans that they would become independent sometime in the future that would be the nat the kind of natural progression for them and they're also really loyal to Joseph Howe and he had been a reformer in the 1820s and 30s and he was from loyalist stock and uh, he had a, a newspaper called the Nova Scotian and if you look at pre-confed history you always talk about Joseph Howe and, and uh, his uh, reforming tendencies so uh, in the 19 uh, sorry in the 1830s 
in the 1830s, he was involved through his newspaper in a libel suit. And it was against the ruling elite, uh, you know, the people that counted in Halifax. And he published a letter in his newspaper saying the people, and it exposed some of the highest level people in the colony, including judges, uh, to charges of corruption. And so, uh, you know, he's, <laughs> of course, libel. So he goes to court and he should have lost. Uh, but he, again, it's the day before iPads, the uh, days before iPads and stuff. So he defended himself for six hours to the jury and uh, the jury found him innocent. Although um, the, uh, the, truth, uh, the, the truth was no defense in a libel case in those days. The law changed after that. But <laughs> even though he'd said something that was completely right, you couldn't libel public figures. You couldn't say bad things about oh. public figures. And in fact, uh, the, the judge was one of the people mentioned in, in the case, <laughs> the guy that was trying his case. But uh, he, he, uh, he got off. And on the basis of this, he thought, well, you know, I'll just become involved in politics as well. So like the reformers in Upper Canada, your William Lyon Mackenzie's newspaper man, and, and then turns to politics. Joseph Howe's the same, uh, the same kind of guy. So he becomes the first premier of um, the Nova Scotian government that is the first to practice responsible government. You know where the Queen takes the advice of um, the leader of the elected majority in the House, not just the Governor General. So you know he has a long uh, kind of string of successes there and he's hugely popular with the electorate and and um, shares with them over the years this kind of mystical attitude that he has to Nova Scotia's possible role in, in the future of the empire, you know, sees that Nova Scotia, like India, <laughs> Nova Scotia could be the jewel in the crown, you know, that it's got lots to offer. Uh, and this idea that over the long haul, maybe independence is on the cards for them. So, uh, you know, if you if you were to be in favour of Confederation, you would probably have to drop your attachment to, to Joseph Howe. And he's actually premier again, up until the year before all those confederation talks, up until about 1863, and then his career's at a bit of a crossroads. Now, some people say, and I don't, don't think it's probably right, but some people say that he was just kind of, you know, annoyed and, and frustrated because he wasn't premier anymore, he wasn't involved in the talks, and so he's kind of like, yeah, I don't like <laughs> confederation. But it looks, though, that that, that was a, a long-term thing for him, uh, seeing Nova Scotia having this special place. And instead of, uh, he was hoping to be made governor of something, maybe even governor general of India, which would be the top job in the world. Instead of that, he gets to be uh, the fisheries commissioner of the St. Lawrence. And so not not a happy man not at all. Not quite as good as no, governor No, not general. quite as good. You know, smelly little boats on the St. <laughs> Lawrence, lots of fish. Uh, of course, good for fish and chips. He probably That's could true. have like free fish and chips mm. whenever he wanted if he was the fisheries commissioner. So in the short term, you could say, well, you're a bit suspicious of his, uh, you know, his opposition to confederate but as I said, it looks from studies of his life, it looks as though he had the same attitude uh, all the way uh, along. But like any good kind of career politician, I, I'm so cynical, just terrible. Um, once he realized he'd failed to stop it, then, you know, he decided to kind of fight from within to get Nova Scotia the best possible deal. And so in uh, 1869, uh, he accepted Macdonald's offer of a cabinet position and Macdonald had written to him in January of 69 uh, on the eve of offering his position and, uh, and this is another quote from, from Macdonald, the consummate politician, he said, so anxious am I for the pacification of Nova Scotia that I'm willing to depart from the usual constitutional course and consult you on all the principal appointments in Nova Scotia so come into my cabinet, I'll let you make all the patronage appointments you want and then you know you, you can work within that system so it it ends the trouble with Nova Scotia temporarily anyway you know they kind of quieten down and so by 1869 the union is intact uh, in the east and as I said to you a minute ago Nova Scotians had been had been right the the economy doesn't really you know blossom after that uh, it lost its manufacturing base to central Canada and it's about the same time that the age of sale ends which is devastating for the Nova Scotian economy so factors outside of anyone's control really um, and in fact uh, it again in 1886 becomes the first province to vote in a separatist government the, <laughs> so we always think of the west being the ones that are upset about things like that but actually Nova Scotia goes to that trough twice huh. in uh, uh, within the space of two decades and of course, then once they're elected on that platform, they have to kind of, you know, work around that because obviously nobody's leaving by that time. And then, you know, you get um, in the 1920s, the Maritime Rights Movement. 
um, you know, anger against Central Canada for the disaster of the economy. Uh, and again, in the 1970s, there was a, an, a, a kind of movement for Atlantic Canada to leave and have its own confederation again. So <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same. So Absolutely. economic downturns, you know, bring kind of responses like that. So, yeah, so not plain sailing for the East, certainly. Um, but uh, there are other places as well that are in the in the general story. Well, let's talk yeah. about the Ontario expansionists. Uh, uh, did, did they get their uh, their dream come true, well, as it were? Well, they do. In a way, they do. Um, you know, they're, 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 of course, the group of Ontario expansionists that think that the West holds the key to national unity, you know, will make it from one part of the, the um, continent to the other. Uh, the problem is that the Western Territories, of course, Rupert's Land is held by the Hudson Bay Company, and so you have to then negotiate if you want that area to come in you have to negotiate uh, also, known also known as the bay the bay also known as the bay the bay with For those short. incredibly expensive hudson bay blankets it still costs <laughs> like 400 bucks or something i tried to yeah. trade something for oh, one they wouldn't let me i know it's terrible i only terrible. take money now i tried to trade my pendleton so blanket for a <laughs> hudson bay company blanket and they wouldn't wear it at all even the hudson bay company scarf is like 70 bucks or something it's just unbelievable or this, three beaver this, pelts yeah and yeah. a gun a winchester <laughs> rifle three beaver pelts a couple of six packs, uh, maybe some of those beers that they've just stopped allowing the ten <laughs> percent, seventy ounce one bottle of beer thing. Yeah, you know, you go in there and they're just not like they used to be no, at all. They've they changed. Yeah, they really have. I mean, they still have the cannon pointing at you when you try and go up to the hill, but you know, it's yeah, it's very different. So anyway, uh, the Hudson Bay Company, it turns out, is willing um, to surrender its administrative responsibility for the area. Uh, Canadian politicians want to purchase the area. The British, of course want to make sure that the Americans don't get the, this part of the West, so they're into it as well. Um, and in the negotiations for this this territory, Rupert's Land, I suppose I should point out as well that a lot of the directors of the Hudson Bay Company uh, were also uh, MPs in the House of Commons and the House of Lords in Britain. So they're working with two hats, their beaver hat and then their other hat. <laughs> they're working as you know British politicians who want to see this transfer happen and then with their other little hat, their Hudson Bay Company directors who want to make sure they get a good deal for the land that they're just about to hand over. But I think the pressure is more towards you know, the British side of it rather than the economic, because they actually ask for a lot of money and then the British government's like, oh, I don't think so. It'll have to be a lot less because Canada doesn't actually have any money and we're going to have to pass a temporary loan act to give them the money to get the stuff off us. Because <laughs> yeah. we're the politicians right. with the with the beaver hats, so uh, lots of stuff like that going on. So uh, for the Dominion, representing kind of the French Canadian interests, is uh, George Etienne Cartier, and for the English, it's William McDougall, and he comes back into the picture, of course. So they're both sent to London to negotiate for the surrender of Rupert's Land. And it's a huge territory. It's all of the land that drains by river into the Hudson Bay. And so that comes to, uh, you know, I don't know, like a million, two million square miles. I know there's a big difference between one million and two million square miles. But it's huge. It's a huge amount of land. Big. Um, but yeah. And, and the population, you know, native, mostly scattered throughout the region, maybe as high as 100,000, hard to say. Uh, and then a, a little concentrated population at Red River or you know Winnipeg of a bit about 12,000 people so uh, the the problem is that nobody in the territory is actually consulted why would they it's only Métis people and native people so now you know government doesn't really see them as counting so they 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 don't consult with them so people at Red River um they know that something's going on, but they don't know about it from the government. They know about it from this little group of uh, expansionists from Ontario uh, who are living amongst them at uh, at Red River. So it might not get the you know the full deal, and there's a lot of kind of bragging rights, like yeah, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna take over this place, and the people that are there are like, oh, what's gonna happen to us? So, uh, but it's it's more complicated than that, of course, because there's a an English speaking Métis community with a Rupert's land. The country born fathers are from the Hudson Bay Company, English or Scottish, mothers, Korean, Assiniboy. And then there's the traditional French Metis uh, that probably were the Northwest Company, Scottish and French Canadian <laughs> fathers, and Korean Assiniboy mothers. And there is a division between those two groups. The, uh, the Rupert's Landers think that this will be a good thing. 
Uh, and the, so the, the English Métis think it would be a good thing and the French Métis are really worried about it and then lots of other people are worried as well. So the deal was that the Hudson Bay Company would get £300,000 and it would also get one twentieth of uh, all the land in the Fertile Belt all the way across the prairies. This becomes a little problematic uh, later on, but it could choose the land itself. And um, this is why Western cities are sometimes a little bit wonky because huge chunks in the middle of cities tended to belong to the Hudson Bay Company. So for our own lovely city, uh, the Hudson Bay Company reserve land was on the city map and it was um, the land from the Journal Building and the McDougall Church all the way to Kingsway. So the city grows up east of that. Mm. That's where all the trouble is, eh? The, say the police station in the central part of the, the town. So that the, the, the city kind of grows up east of that because you weren't allowed to be in the Hudson Bay Reserve Territory. And they don't, they're not forced to sell it by the government until about 20 years later. So they keep that land. So... Uh, so, as I said before, Canada doesn't have any money, so the uh, the British government um, negotiate that for them, and they they don't pass they they pass a temporary act for the governing of the Northwest Territories, and that's because they're not really sure they're not entirely sure where it ends. So it's just a kind of temporary act till you kind of go out there and work out where everything is, um, and it gets a lieutenant governor and an appointed council. So it doesn't it's not going to come into confederation as a province. It's just going to come in as a territory that doesn't have an elected government so again that's another little problem it doesn't have responsible government and and um it's just not like all the rest <laughs> which of this is not like the others yeah it would be rupert's land is not like the others uh so the hudson bay company gave up its deed in november of 1869 as soon as the money's deposited into the account and at the same time john a mcdonald is frantically trying to get in touch with them in london and say don't put the money into the account there's been a bit of a stramash there's been a bit of trouble but it's it's too late and of course we know what, what followed as the Red River Rising or the Red River Rebellion. They never call it a war unless you win it. And then they go, the Red River War. Mm. But it's always a rising or a rebellion if you're not if you're not the ones winning it. So um, so you have Louis Riel as the leader of this uh, local Métis population and um, and you get the, the Métis, of course, uh, calling themselves the, the new nation ever since... Uh, about 1816 in the Battle of Seven Oaks in that area, so children of the fur trade, as I said, but a division between them, the Anglo ones not kind of on the same side as the as the other ones. So um, they're, they're really apprehensive about the takeover because they haven't been consulted. They, they have some contact, as I said, with Ontario expansionists. One is... Um, the guy that owns the the Norwester, the newspaper, and also owns a shop, uh, Dr. Uh, Schultz. And... Uh, in his newspaper, he talks all the time about the Métis falling back in the face of civilization, you know, the march of civilization. These people are fit for domestic servitude. It'll be easy to get their land off them. So the only people that they're hearing from are these morons that are just, oh, did I say morons? Mm -hmm. yeah, just the, the only people that they're hearing from are these, are these men who are, are just being really quite rude about them. And normally, uh, Bishop Taché, uh, who was at Red River, would have been the, the leading spokesman for the Métis community, but he was off at uh, off in Rome at um, one of the, the big meetings that the Pope had called. So he's away, and, um, you know, there are a couple of really kind of annoying things that happened there, but one of the, the people that had been there and had left, you know, had grown up there, it was Louis Riel, had left, he, you know, seemed to have lots of promise. So they'd sent him, the church had sent him down to Montreal for a classical education, hoping he'd become a priest. He doesn't become a priest, but he does end up uh, coming back to Red River at just this kind of critical moment. They have a terrible, terrible winter the, the year before. There's crop failures, you know, the fur trade's not what it used to be. Uh, there's all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of problems. And so Riel comes back, and so it turns out that he ends up as the spokesman of what will become the Métis rebellion hmm. so I'll just finish there because i have to talk a bit more about luriel another time <laughs> all right that wraps up part one of part this uh, one. discussion this yes. further discussion of That's confederation right. on the history of canada we'll <laughs> Will see it you ever end <laughs> wow we'll see you in part two